Hello, and welcome everyone to the Healthy Empath Podcast. I am your host, Mike Marshausen. Today, I am joined by a lovely guest here. His name is Max Marshausen. And the last name sound a little familiar? Yes, he is my cousin, but uh, so if you were guessing brother, he's pretty close enough. Soul yeah. brother, for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but my cousin, and yeah, I'm excited to have him here today. We're going to talk about the masculinity, the healthy masculine, because uh, that's something that's been coming up a lot and people have been asking me about. And I think he can speak to this, uh, you know, pretty nicely. He does men's work. He's been involved in groups, started to lead groups. He's a teacher and healer. And he's just, yeah, pretty a solid dude. And not everyone knows this about him. He's actually pretty savvy when it comes to uh, being a little psychic ninja there too and connecting <laughs> with <laughs> entities and ghosts and that kind of stuff <laughs> but uh three ways <laughs> yeah so yeah welcome to the show and if you want to give any other bio or professional type bio feel free or if you don't feel the need then we don't even have to excellent well it's an honor to be here with you mike love uh love anytime the soul brothers can get together and jam out super excited to be here um, you, you both covered it, man. I think the, the only thing I'll really add in there is, um, yeah, coaching practice is up and running and we're officially live. So uh, if anybody resonates with a lot of what's what Mike and I are jiving on here today and you want to learn more, feel free to head over to uh, my website, which is just maxmarsh.com um, and we can talk more. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So let's start first. So because uh, a lot of conversations they start talking about, oh, masculine masculinity but it's never really defined first and it can just mean a lot of different things that probably doesn't have a set definition right it just depends who you ask and so I guess for the purpose of our conversation let's give it a little bit of a description if you could do that for us yeah absolutely it's a difficult thing to define because I think within every individual it takes many different forms um, but I found the best way that it was described to me uh, is in the comparison of like the yin and the yang. The masculine and the feminine do not exist without each other. And the masculine almost acts as a container for the feminine to exist in, where that masculine energy can be really direct and forward. And that feminine energy tends to be more chaotic and and because that feminine energy stems from creation. Um, so the masculine acts as that container. Um, so for me, masculinity is very much about uh, creating that container for myself when I have that creative feminine energy boil up um, and I need to really tune in and listen to it. Uh, I rely on the masculine part of myself to be more direct and clear and cut and, and to trust and to lean into that more stable feeling energy, so to speak. Um, you know, before we're, we're man or woman, we are human. Uh, everybody has the masculine within them. Um, they're not, they're not exclusive. You're not entirely masculine or entirely feminine. You've got a little bit of everything. Um, but for when it comes to a healthy masculinity, um, I find that it's the man who creates that container within himself for that feminine energy to arise and doesn't reject it, uh, but sees himself as just a wholehearted masculine male. All right. All right. And then, so going on a more personal note or even a deeper description of what that, that looks like on you know, a day to day. Can you take us a little bit through your journey and you know from starting whatever you want to start, but into the rise of you know what the healthy masculine looks like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a very long, ongoing journey, um, learning a lot day by day, especially even more so now that I'm making this my life's work. It seems like around every corner I'm learning more, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> more. Um, but I believe uh, for me, the best place to start is um, really when the, all this kind of cracked open for me uh, in 2017, when we went to that Theta Healing Retreat with Joyce. Um, I mark that as really the start of when I took my first step into this, into this healing journey, into what it means to be a man in today's world. Um, and then with that came you know, reflecting back on my childhood and the different various traumatic events that had happened throughout my childhood um, that created these learned behaviors that weren't really what I valued um, in this day anymore. They served me at that point in my life, but as I traveled on down this, this healing road, 
uh, and this road towards what a, a wholehearted masculine male looks like, I was able to see it's time to let go of some of those old behaviors and old patterns because they served me once, but they're not serving me anymore. Um, so I, you know, my, when I was five years old, my parents divorced and from a young age, I've just been, I was an innate empath still to this day, a highly sensitive person, very in tune with the energies around me. Um, and I, I, for those familiar with Iron John or, or, and Robert Bly, he wrote that book. He talks about, um, being copper, a, a conductor. I was very much, and still am to this day, a conductor. I was able to, you know, place my hand on my father's chest as an infant uh, and transmute his pain through me to the earth. Uh, and same with my mother, just had that kind of natural copper conductor to me. Um, and so it's really been a lesson of how do I, when do I turn that on? When do I activate the copper? When is the right time to be a conductor and use that healing medicine? Because based off the learned behaviors that I had through my struggle with my parents' divorce at a young age, and even as, it, as I started this healing process and digging up more of these wounds and what was beneath the surface, I was realizing my tendency to, to caretake all of the time um, and, I, and what a drain that was on me. So for me, the first lesson was really getting firm in my boundaries, um, both in intimate relationships and just in friendships. Um, I had to take care of myself to take care of others. And in doing so, I had to become really solid and firm in the ways in which I set boundaries, uh, which wasn't always easy for me. Um, I think one of my favorite analogies of empathic people and boundaries, it's like this picture of a of an old door and the, the only thing holding the door locked shut is a Cheeto. And it said um, boundaries for any like intense empaths in the room. And I was like, oh man, that used to be for me for so, so long. So I've really had to train myself to, instead of having that lock or that doorknob on the outside for people to rattle and come in and break down my boundaries and kind of rustle up my energy and get me triggered, I had to get the doorknob on the inside. So I could be the one to choose when to open it and when to, when am I going to like dig deeper with this trigger? And when is this just a trigger that I need to let go of? Um, and in this, this process of really getting firm in my boundaries and acknowledging which triggers are the right triggers to be chasing. Um, I just, it was this deep journey in honoring myself uh, and validating my own experience and meeting myself where I'm at. I feel like as men, we have a habit to, because it's been programmed in us for so long, um, we don't have problems, right? We're the sole provider. We do it all. We take the hit on the chin. We just go, go, go. Nothing ever weighs us down. That's just not, it's not in our human DNA. Like we're going to get bogged down. Life's going to get hard. And you got to be able to meet yourself where you're at in order to rise above it all. And that's really also been a huge lesson for me in this journey um, is how do I meet myself where I'm at? honor that experience for what it is um, and give myself the time I need to honor it, but don't dwell on it too long and then rise up out of it to take right action and to continue moving forward. Um, it hasn't been an easy journey. It's been difficult, um, but at the same time, those difficulties and those times where, you know, I set a boundary, but didn't set it firm enough. I got blocked and I had to go and reset the boundary. Those were the steps that really led me to get to a place where I can comfortably say today, excuse me, I'm honoring myself to the, to the utmost degree that I possibly can. And if there's a time that I'm not, it's that opportunity for me to, to sit with myself and be like, okay, where's the, uh, where's the disconnect here? It's a, a lot of empaths, you know, they have questions around boundaries because that, that's a, a common theme that comes up. So what is your, what does that process look like? I, I, I was just talking about like, you know, choosing, choosing yourself first and honoring like what's best for you regardless of um what that you know might cause a reaction in the other person or is it something else because yeah that's definitely a big uh challenge point for empaths and you know so they think it's a little more than just trying to put up like a, a shield wall or a personal bubble or something like that so yeah, what, what other yeah, tips do you have when it comes to setting boundaries and holding them firm Great question. And another thing that I really had to give myself permission to do throughout this process was the permission to be messy in the process. I'm not somebody who likes to do things and not do it perfectly the first time. That's a big like 
anxiety provoking thing for me. If I don't get it right the first time, I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> um, but there was a simple lightness and, um, and, and levity that came for me when I was able to give myself permission to be messy. And what I mean by that is, say you've set a boundary with a significant other or somebody important in your life and they come back with that same, whatever it might be, they're violating the boundary, even though you've set the boundary, give yourself to give yourself permission, um, feel whatever you're feeling, the anxiety, the, the difficulty around like, oh man, but like, I really want to be here for this person. I stop, I take a deep breath. I check in with myself and I always say, all right, this was a boundary that I'd set previously and to honor myself, I need to stand firm in this boundary, even if it feels messy. Um, so for me, that's, that's re simply restating the boundary and simply like, Hey, I love you, but I'm, I am not in a space where I can unhinge that boundary to talk to you about this right now. I still need time. Maybe there'll be a time when I can let this boundary down, but for where I'm at in my own life right now, this is where I got to be. And I find when you, when you bring it back to the self, when you can honestly reflect and be like, this is me right now. And this is what I have to do to preserve my own well-being." When you're being that real and that honest, if it's going to bring a trigger out of the other person you're interacting with, then that's your opportunity to be like, okay, like I, I reflected my experience to this individual and it triggered them. This is their, this is now their trigger that they need to be working through. And you have to be able to walk away from that situation and trusting you did everything you could do for yourself and for this individual. Um, it's difficult to, especially if we've for so long have been letting our boundaries be violated to, to help somebody we love, because that feels like the right thing to do. Um, when you do stand up for yourself and say, mm, not this time, they're going to, they're going to come back at that boundary and try and whittle it down because they've been able to do it in the past. Um, so it is leaning into the messiness of learning how to reset boundaries and stand firm with that person. Even if they're upset that you're continuing to reset this boundary and not giving way like you used to before, um, you're going to create some friction there. Uh, but I've also found in the creation of that friction with this other person you, who you might be setting the boundary with, it's an opportunity for them to reflect and start doing some of their own work at the same time. And I've really seen that as I've, um, you know, raised my own vibration, done my own healing work, whatever feels aligned with your own journey. Um, I've seen other people in my circle start to start to level up as well um, when I kind of can allow them to take personal responsibility for their own emotional experience. And I've stopped to take personal responsibility for everyone else's emotional experience. Yeah, it's, and it's like trying to find this balance between actually having compassion and empathy, but not to the point of like where you're, you know, taking it on and really being able to say, you know, your brokenness is not my brokenness kind of thing. Um, you know, I saw that the other day. And then I also was talking about, you know, I heard this fairly recently too, and I, it just made a lot of sense to me and I really liked it. And it was just like, almost like, what if we could all operate from this belief of, you know, what if what is best for me is best for you, you mm -hmm. know, is best for everyone. Yeah. And we all kind of had that belief that, you know, doing what is best for ourselves is actually best for everyone, even though it may look different and the other person might not think so. Right. Cause at the time, you know, their fear, their, you know, attachments and their trauma can come up and, you know, say, no, 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 like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to face this. And what can, how could you do that to me? But, you know, by you honoring yourself, you doing what's best for you and, you know, trusting that, you know, that's probably, you know, the best for everyone. And then if we could all, yeah, it has a lot to do, I guess, with self-responsibility too. Yeah. All right. And just, you know, owning yourself and your experience and what's going on. And even if you don't like something that's happening, being able to go in and reflect on that and work with, you know, whatever that might be. And honestly, Mike, I think one of the, the harder lessons for me that's really only taken me up until recently, and even still, I have difficulty with this, but trusting that the other individual that I'm setting this boundary with or, or in this conflict with um, is able to take personal responsibility for their own emotional experience and that I'm able to um, compassionately and wholeheartedly walk away knowing that they are taking responsibility for their emotional experience. Now, yeah. directly in the moment, they may not be. They may just be like triggered and pissed off and mad. Um, but that's always my cue to really kind of remove myself from the situation. Be like, you got some shit you're working through here. I'm going to let you work through it. 
If you want to reflect and digest about this after you've had some time to sit with it, let's talk about it then. Um, and I think just holding firm and trusting that people will take personal responsibility for their emotional experience is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, and even if they aren't going to do so, um, just, you know, love them from the sidelines and help them along their journey by standing on the sidelines. Don't get too enmeshed with uh, circles that you don't need to be enmeshed with. Mm. Yeah, I, a personal example of that was after, you know, the, the, the last mushroom ceremony I did, right, which was all about play and having fun and all these things, right? And then, you know, telling Susie about it, my wife, and she immediately just like, super triggered like right away right because in her experience stress overwhelmed kids you know he doesn't have a you know he's not nursing and doesn't have, he can go, just go do whatever he wants whenever he wants so just like immediately just like enraged <laughs> and then i was like well i mean i can have there's no more clear confirmation that exists than you know when you have an experience like that so like i you know i know that i need to to honor that and you know that doesn't mean just like going off and being alone all the time but it, it does mean you know doing you know what i need to do to take care of myself and to, to have fun and not you know run myself into the ground like all stressed out and working too hard and then so yeah that was a reaction that you know her you know those parts of her that i didn't like at all and um but right sh shortly after that you know, she had a big kind of opening and release and realization uh, and, and now she's at a place where she's actually you know able to take time for herself you know and, and spend more time away uh, than she was and you know because before it was you know all just you know her her story and whatever narrative and in, in the subconscious that was keeping her trapped in this cycle and not giving herself she wasn't giving herself permission to take time to take care of herself right which a lot of mothers get caught into and you know so it was like by me doing what and saying what was best for me that and immediately it didn't look like you know, that was best for her. She wouldn't agree with that, but then, you know, it did end up being what was best for everyone. So I think that, yeah, that's a kind of a recent example that I've had with that. Yeah. And it, funny that you mentioned that. I was just reflecting and thinking too, that I often find um, lots of times the boundaries we set with people, not only is that boundary medicine for ourselves, but in the long term, and sometimes even in the short term, it sounds like more short term with that example of Susie, um, the medicine is also for the person you're setting the boundary with and it gives them an opportunity to kind of take a step back and be like hmm maybe there's something deeper here i should be looking at <laughs> yeah for sure and then so a lot of people also yeah well this is a question i've got too since the when it comes to the masculine right because there's a lot of you know these women who end up either being with men or attracting men who um, I guess, aren't that in touch with, you know, all these aspects of themselves. And, you know, <laughs> I guess maybe you don't have the best answer around this either, because, you know, your, your partner is a, a therapist there. So she's, you know, pretty into this stuff. And, you know, Susie, of course, is too. And so what if, you know, for the woman listening or something like that, if, you know, or, or anyone, you know, if their partner isn't quite, you know, on this, on the same page, to a lot of these things like uh you know they're they, they want a more healthy masculine in their partner or something like that like, have you seen any experiences or yeah like with anything like that or like how to balance that or deal with that when you know when you when you yeah aren't seeing that healthy masculine in your life yeah that's a really tough one like um the reason it, it's so tough is uh, i th i think specifically in that relationship dynamic where the partner has um, um, somebody who is lacking that that healthy masculinity and having a real t hard time validating their emotional experience and being with their emotional body. Um, it's a uh, it's so difficult for men. It's so uh, it's natural. Like this is this should be a natural thing for all men, right? But it's been like basically beaten out of us since childbirth. The uh, by the age of five a young male is heard, has heard at least five times now, um, stop crying, you're too old for that. Um, just all these different examples throughout growth where men- Stop have, whining. Yeah. What's that? Stop whining, yeah. Stop, yeah. stop whining. Stop whining, <laughs> yeah, right? Where, you know, as a, as a five-year-old or just as a child in general, when you're being robbed of your emotional experience, then you're kind of, you, it's put back on you and you're like, what the hell am I supposed to do? Like, what do I just- 
go through life like this? Am I a robot? Like, do I, am I not supposed to have my emotional experience? Um, and it's really invalidating and it can take years and years and years um, to really get that back, to kind of go back to that inner child and, and really honor those emotional experience. That's, that's really part of the journey I'm on right now is revisiting that, that young Max and just validating whatever difficult emotional experience he had throughout his childhood. Um, but it, it can, I think it really depends on, you know, the, the level of trauma, the, what it, the man was exposed to in his childhood. And even after childhood, I think everybody's in their own time zone um, and they're going to get there when they're supposed to get there. Uh, and for the person in the relationship, I, I think you got to check in with yourself and really say like, do I have the capacity to be able, and you can tell like on an intuitive level, they're going to get there, just maybe not in the time frame that I want them to get there. Um, yeah, it comes back to checking with yourself. Like, do I have, do I have it in my own heart? Do I have the space to be able to wait um, for this person to, to arrive on their journey? Um, Cause in my experience in, in trying to name that for men and, and in trying to kind of show them the way um, you can show them as much as they want, as you want, but they're, they got to walk through the door themselves. You can't hold their hand and walk them through the door. Um, there, there's typically some moment in a man's life. I feel, cause I've had it where he's able to be like enough of this shit. There's, there's a better way to be doing this. And I gotta, I gotta figure it out for me. Um, when it can come from that level of self-inspiration, it's going to be so much more meaningful. I think the, the track along the journey is going to be a lot more committed. Um, but you know, if, if that's not, if, you know, if they're, they're taking a while and you're starting to feel, mm, I don't know if I have the space, I, you know, the one thing I always encourage is just really honest, real conversation about it. Um, reflecting on your own experience as much as possible. Um, and then from there, just checking with them and being, I'm, I'm wondering if this is something you're willing to work on. Um, I think always starting with a question like that and really, you know, being firm in your own boundary of like, hey, I could, it would really help our relationship and I would feel so much more connected if you could, you know, work on this. Are you willing to work on this? Um, and then that, you, gives you, you know, just attack them and make fun of them and point out yeah. what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, little baby, get up. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I usually don't berate them and attack them. Usually, <laughs> Yeah, the, the art of subtlety and I think holding space and um, letting them take responsibility for their own emotional experience. And I find- Maybe just seeing them as babies. What's that? <laughs> maybe just seeing them as babies, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, they, maybe they, didn't get, they didn't get the nurturing that they needed as babies. And so if you're the partner, you know, maybe and then you have to step up and you know, start nurturing them and just being able to see that, you know, that part of them. And then maybe eventually it'll start to just crack open a little, little bit and just little little pieces here and there that will start to like that like an egg as you said see like a picture of like the you know an egg starts to crack and like these light lights like beaming out yeah. <laughs> this, like, this vision i have right now it's like you just look at or yeah maybe visualize them as an egg and then you need to nurture and take care of this fragile egg and then let it start to slowly oh there's another crack Oh, here's another crack and then perhaps it'll just completely come out. <laughs> but also on top to piggyback off of that i think it's also important as the person doing the nurturing to make sure you're carving out time to nurture yourself too um because it yeah, is a lot i don't take responsibility for it yeah exactly um but yeah that uh, what i was going to say about the personal responsibility piece i find there's a lot of power in that when you when you kind of like say your piece, step into your power, you set the boundary and then can walk, step away from that and just trust that they're going to have their emotional um, experience um, and trust that they're going to take responsibility from that. And also kind of like, don't give them the option to project it onto you. So if they do start projecting onto you, that's when I say, I'm not, you know, that's when I set an boundary, another boundary, be like, I can see you're pretty frustrated with the boundary that I've just set. I'm going to give you some space to kind of work on this. Um, and I've found there's a lot of, of power. So how do you balance? Okay. I was just gonna say, there's a, I find a lot of power in healing. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought you were done. Back to them and let them take that responsibility. And they kind of mm -hmm. have to sit with it and see, oh shit, where did that come from? Why did I lash out when my partner asked me to, to go pick up water for the week? Like, what, where did that come from? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I thought you were done. I was gonna ask about, 
you know, setting those firm boundaries, but also like, so like drawing this line between like taking out yeah, personal responsibility and time for yourself versus just like narcissism. Mm -hmm. And cause I'm even, it's easy, especially if you, you know, people who are very analytical of themselves and therefore judgmental of themselves, such as myself. And, and <laughs> like, you know, so I'll be doing something, but then I'll there'll always be like this little piece in the back of my mind is like, am I being a narcissist right now? <laughs> you know, because if you're basically, you know, at this point where we're like, you know, I don't want to deal with your shit right now. Like it just, you know, it also depends, I think, how, how you approach with it. But like, yeah. So, yeah, so finding a line between like setting a boundary versus also being like, you know, kind of like, you know, gaslighting and being a narcissist and just being like, yeah, I, I, oh, that's your problem. You should probably get help with that kind of thing. So yeah. do you have anything to add about the fine line there? Um, yeah, I think you, I, you know, I always come back to checking in with myself and I really do a thorough check in with myself before I engage in any kind of conflict with my partner, um, for that exact reason. Um, I need to make sure that my clock's good, that my insides are, that I'm feeling like I have the energy to be able to devote to this and to devote to the conflict in a healthy resolving way, but not coming from a a lash out, you know, stifling kind of way, but somewhere where this conflict is going to lead us to the other side of the door, uh, where we're back on that common ground and can move forward in this relationship in a more healthy way. Um, so to when I'm checking in with myself, I'm really like very conscious of, okay, how much of this is mine? How much of this do I need to own of this experience? And how much of it um, does my partner need to own? Um, and I'm always... I mean, if you're just new to this and really kind of retraining that intuitive sense and really getting a feel for yourself, it's going to take practice. It's going to take time. I'm not saying that these things are just going to like happen overnight. You're going to be able to tap in that right away and be like, oh yeah, I'm being a narcissist. I can, I can contribute to this. Um, so give yourself permission to make the mistake. Maybe there are times uh, when you fall on your face and you should have really stepped up in that moment and been there for your partner. Um, but the importance of being able to reflect back on that and be like, hey, I wasn't as present as I should have been because I was, you know, acting from this narcissistic place and I wanted to make amends and kind of work through this together. Um, as honest and as real you can be with yourself, try and practice that with your partner. Cause I just think, like I said, honesty is the best policy. There's not a whole lot of room for argument when you're keeping it super real with your partner. Um, and I think when you can meet each other where you're at, uh, then you can really work to lay the brick one, one brick at a time as firmly and as grounded as possible as you can. Uh, but it, it, I mean, overall, that's, that's a really tricky one. Um, I think there's this uh, level of fear of selfishness that comes in from specifically when working with your romantic partner when it comes to conflict um, and how much you want to be involved in that. Um, it's, up to, it's up to you to be, really be able to name like, hmm, how present have I been in the relationship recently? I think that's a good place to start. Have I been you know, just fit to my own devices and taking a lot of space right now? Do I actually have the capacity to be here for my partner? And I'm just like tuning out the world right now. Um, and following off of that, maybe you've been there too much for your partner and you really do need to speak up for yourself and be like, I've been holding a lot of space for you recently. I'm noticing that I'm getting a little exhausted from this and I need to take a step back. Um, so when I'm ready to kind of engage in this, um, after I've taken the space I need, let's try again. Yeah, as we're talking, I'm, I'm also seeing this kind of shadow element to that whole narcissist thing, right? These things have become popular in the empath world, right? Like, you know, just like, oh, you're a narciss you're narcissist, energy vampire, like toxic masculinity, right? Just throwing out these names um, that uh, in a way that's not very useful or healthy and right so it's now is like that's one of the big things now is oh narcissist narcissism and it is a real thing and there are some like, great books about like you know are you know uh, a victim of you know narciss narcissistic parents and the trauma that can cause i've definitely seen that i know that's a real experience yeah but there's also this whole thing where you just if somebody doesn't do what you want them to do or you don't like something where you just, you just call them a narcissist. Uh, I think that's, you know, right. Just like, oh, that person's energy is toxic. All that, all right. Everyone in my life is toxic. I'm like, well, 
how how do you think you've gotten to a point where everyone in your life is toxic? Like, what what role are you playing there? You know, uh, obviously a big one, <laughs> and you're probably pretty toxic. <laughs> but the same thing, yeah. But there's not all oh, that person is just like it's just, yeah. It's just a I've seen it turn into just a way of like name calling versus yeah. like this actual like healthy exploration. So then I say that you know like this this judgment I have of oh am I being a narcissist? Right? Then the other part of that comes back to that is so what? You know, maybe there's a healthy balance there, mm -hmm. um, and you know, be you know, being able to, yeah, just just like in anything, like right, there's a healthy balance of anything. So you have narcissism and empathy on this, you know, kind of spectrum, and you flow in between the two whenever you need to. Maybe sometimes you need to be a narcissist to take care of yourself, and to, or you know, for you know, have maybe even like myself, you have a lot of different things to do and like business and I, I have to take that time. And, and so you know, maybe I do need to be like, you know what? Yeah, whatever. Like I, I got to do this, right? Like, uh, you know, and, and being able to turn that on, but then also being able to turn it off and like switch back over. So yeah, that's definitely something worth noting is once stop calling people narcissists blindly and, and then also, yeah, seeing it more of this like spectrum and like, if it's okay to, yeah, you know, step in there a little bit because I think everyone obviously has those tendencies. And then another thing related to that is that, yeah, this idea of that came up for a while. I was like toxic masculinity, right? And a lot of women just saying, oh, you know, he's toxic, toxic masculine. And like, that's another same thing I would flip to someone and just being like, well, what kind of feminine do you need to be to attack, attract a toxic, you know, masculine? <laughs> All right. And such a, I'd love to kind of dive a little deeper with the phrase toxic masculinity, because for a long time, I've had a difficult, there's a, I guess, yeah, I guess the word is triggering as much as I don't often like to use that phrase, but toxic masculinity um, is difficult for me because for me, the word toxic implies that there's no antidote. Um, and I personally don't see masculinity as a toxic energy, but I think the individual who uses their masculinity in a toxic way, that's the toxicity. Masculin masculinity itself is not toxic, but the person who's wielding it has some poisons in them that they're acting from that, either that place of trauma or that place of narcissism or greed or gaslighting. I think that's where the toxicity comes in. Um, but I'm really trying to, to change that toxic masculinity phrase because yeah, I personally, it just doesn't line up with my values and seeing masculinity as a toxic energy because masculinity itself is not, it's not a toxic thing. Like we were talking about earlier, it's a container for the feminine, um, yeah. the feminine and the masculine. Like I said, they, they got to coexist together. Yeah, I agree. And getting, uh, getting some chills on that. Um, and this idea that there is no such thing as toxic mas masculinity. Now we are talking about something else, right? Uh, yeah, this, these tendencies and these behaviors and these things that you, you know, you don't like or that that person is doing and that's either immature or whatever, like just because they're a man, that doesn't mean that it's toxic mas masculinity, right? So, like, you know, the, if it's, could be anything, it could just be their woundedness or psychopathy or <laughs> sociopath or, right? It doesn't make it like toxic masculinity just because a man is the one presenting, you know, these behaviors and traits that are you know less than ideal so that's something i never really thought about and yeah, I, mean, I mean that's such a good thing. point you know, when that man is acting from their wound that's when they're acting from a place of of sickness or toxicity if you want to call it that's that's the individual that's the human living from yeah. their sick place that's not the masculine energy that's just that individual who's living in that suit um, and hasn't resolved their trauma, their fears, their, and just hasn't had the, taken the time to really reflect and examine why am I, why am I living in this in this victim mindset? You know, where where have I been the victim in the past, and where am I continuing to live from that victim mindset? Yeah, that's uh, very fascinating. I, I like that a lot. So another thing is, that I want to talk about is yeah, maybe we can start chatting about you know this masculine. Oh, well, so maybe that's not even a thing I was gonna say. Yeah, I, I think it is. This masculine kind of wound, right? The, the, this wound within men, yeah. and that you know creates less than ideal behaviors. That creates you know an insensitivity to themselves, to who they are, and so this this wounding there. I mean, of course, there's so many different layers and ways to explain it. But what have been your experiences with it in terms of observations and 
you know, I'm just, you know, for yourself, but then also, you know, observing others. And I definitely, yeah, I can touch on stuff, stuff too, and being a man and also just, you know, having a lot of different uh, circles of friends growing up of men, right, between sports, between the army, as in fraternity, um, just like, you know, tons of different things. So I, I've gotten to see uh, a lot of different, observe a lot of different patterns and behaviors. Um, so for specifically, you want me to speak to my experience with my own wound and like what with that's you can if that, if that, yeah, whatever kind of comes up, but just, just talking about, you know, I guess let's go back to like, why, why are so many men so closed off? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it, it goes back to, like I was saying earlier at the age of five, young boys are told, stop crying. You don't cry. You're a man. You take the hit on the fucking chin. You get up, you keep going. That's that. That's just the way life is. Um, and that's what we've been fed for years now. I'm trying to think how far back it went. I want to say the late 1800s is when this really, this culture of uh, uh, machismo, um, macho man, hero, Superman, masculinity stepped in where we, there was this shift and we were told now all of a sudden we're the stewards of the earth. Um, we are the, the sole providers of the family. It's all on our backs. We got to do it. That's a lot of pressure for one man. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, if that's what we're being fed this whole time, that we've got control over it all, we're constantly providing, we don't have problems, we take the hit on the chin, and we keep moving forward, and we don't, we don't feel the emotion attached behind whatever blow we just received. You're just, you're holding all of that in as man, you are keeping it. And this is, this was my personal experience with it. I was, because I didn't know where to direct this emotional energy, I was keeping it inside. And it just created this this pressure cooker inside of me of anger, resentment uh, for myself, for others, for my partners in relationship. And it wasn't until, you know, I really put my foot down and was like, there has to be a better way. Like I cannot keep um, invalidating my own emotional experience. Like these, it's happening for a reason. I can't ignore it. Um, and I think it was, I know it was when I started to shift that frame of thinking of, a oh, man, I don't feel, I don't, I don't cry. I don't have problems. <laughs> Everything's fine. I've got control over it all. Um, when I, when I realistically, I didn't have control over shit. I was just responding to the way things were happening. And because I had all those stored emotions inside of me, I was super reactionary, quick to trigger, quick to anger, quick to lash out and project onto other people. And I feel this is where a lot of men lie today. This is where we live. We've been fed this, this lie that we're not human. We're superhuman. Um, we're Superman. Um, and to some extent, we're all super in our own way. Um, but when it comes to the human experience, you know, if you look at the word emotion, it literally trans to energy and motion. So throughout this human experience, you're going to have the full array of emotions. And that's a beautiful thing. Why shouldn't you? This human experience, our souls are here for a reason so that we can we can soak it all in so we can feel these feelings and feel what it's like to be human, to live on this earth. Um, but when you're denying yourself of that basic human experience, it's creating that conflict, that internal conflict and allowing us to, to lash out. And some of us have held on to that, to those repressed emotions for so long, um, that the lash outs get a lot more violent. They get a lot more serious, especially the, the longer you hold on to it, the more the resentment just builds and the more the anger builds. Um, and for me, I've always translated anger as to really there's a deep sadness that you're just not acknowledging. Um, and what other emotion as men being told that is safe to display other than anger? We're told sadness is like way off limits. You know, that's, I think alone for men, our world in general kind of has this view of sadness as mm -mm, that's not good. Um, but it, yeah, when you take can, some pills, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Thumb it out. You'll be fine. <laughs> um, but I find where the shift comes in is when you can, when you can honor that experience, when you can meet yourself where you're at and say, damn, yeah, my heart's heavy right now. I'm sad. I'm working through some grief. Um, and when you can be that real with yourself, but also that real with others, um, I've seen it take people off guard. I don't think people are used to men or or any other human in general just being that real and honest of, you know when you ask the the age-old question every day of how you doing today and somebody responds honestly sometimes it catches you off guard like oh 
sad. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Cried a lot today. A lot. Yeah. You? <laughs> what? <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, and so this, you know, Robert Bly talks a lot about how we're all wounded and within the wound lies your genius. Um, and I feel for, for so long now, we have been reacting to that wound as men. We haven't been going into the wound to really learn about it. Where did it come from? How did I get this wound? Why is it, why does it pop up in certain circumstances and not in others? So I think when you can flip the script and not live from that space of, mm, I'm wounded, I'm mad, I'm pissed. Everybody's the fucking enemy here. I'm gonna take it out on everyone else, but own it. Take ownership of your wound, take pride of that wound. Where it, I think one of the, one of the most powerful moments for me in one of my men's circles, I was working through a lot of grief. And when I came into the circle, my posture, my shoulders were clenched in tight, I was hunched over. And as I was sharing in the circle, um, one of the men noticed it and he just put his hand on my back and my chest and kind of fixed my posture. And he said, hold your head high in that grief. And I, that was such a huge shift for me of like, oh, I can still live with my grief and be empowered. But I think the message has been for too long that if you have grief, if you have trauma, if you have any kind of emotional baggage, which we all do, we're human beings, that you're not going to get very far in life. But the thing is, we've all got that baggage. It's just a matter of how do we unpack it? How do we ex examine it? How do we work with it? Um, and I feel like that's really the alchemy here for men, right? Is, like I said, going into that wound, unpacking it, really examining it. When do I get triggered most? I used to keep a journal, even at work. Something would pop up, I would write it down. Be like, okay, that set me off. How come? And then from there, what that gave me was the ability to really know what triggers are worthy of me chasing and which ones are just triggers, which ones have the story of my wound attached to it, it's, and which one is more of my ego just pissed off because somebody told me I couldn't do something um, and I don't like red tape or authority. <laughs> um, so yeah, man, I think the wound is, the wound is training ourselves as men to meet ourselves where we're at and acknowledge that we're going to have an emotional experience and that's okay. And that's necessary. And it's necessary if you want to live the most beautiful, fruitful, um, well-examined, well-balanced life, I think, is to just honor the, these parts of yourself, those parts that have been labeled as tough to love by the rest of the world around, around us. Beautiful. Yeah, the saying that came up to me, through me one time, that just always stuck. Uh, it was so simple. It says, the human experience is an emotional experience. And I try to remind myself that all the yeah. time. And I think, yeah, like, and that doesn't just mean certain emotions. That means the whole gamut, like all of them, like the, like being human is being this, you know, emotional uh, being like that's, uh, we experience life through these emotions in our body and our, the state, the health of our bodies related to these emotions and all these things. And so for men to really you know, recognize and own that, like, you know, it can help. Like if you want to live fully, you have to tap in there. And I want to riff about a bunch of different things and okay. have some fun riff. about, <laughs> yeah, just about like these wounds and healing these wounds and just different like stories or just different like perspectives and possibilities. And uh, just kind of follow, you know, the excitement and the chills because I, I started getting it on. All right. So we're talking about healthy masculine. All right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to have a healthy masculine, you also need a healthy a feminine, right? You need that the yin and yang, you need the whole thing. And so if you're working on both those, then it's important to go back to the mother wound and, and the father wound. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of, I want to touch on the mother wound a little bit because the father wound, you know, in men's work and healthy masculine is probably, you know, pretty father, most popular, right? With the relationship with your father and how was that? Yeah. But something that's been coming up for me a lot and learning about and just reading about in books is the mother wound for the men and like how huge that is and in the you know something that's so conditioned within our society i was talking about the this with susie susie the other day and right the uh, how well first of all you know the, since we don't have these rites of passage initiations ceremony right no culture has been stripped uh and so when you're going back looking at that that mother wound you know that's 
that can be a huge one depends on your, your relationship with your mother but even if you had a nice relationship with your mother you know how was she did she ever see you as a man does she see you as a man you know most mothers won't ever see their children as men and that is a huge wound you know that and, and then right you're oh you'll always be my baby you're always this just treating you like a baby and this and that never letting go always seeing you in that light always holding that mental projection of who you used to be without even recognizing who you have become and who you are now yeah they might say things and just you know, acknowledge that there's a part of them that sees that but really you know there is like you know the, the the mothers to the sons i think is a huge part of that wounding and you know just you know babying them and you know not you know allowing them to freely play and grow and challenge and fail and express themselves in all these different ways and so i think that is yeah like a, a huge one and i remember you know just hearing and like some of these well, the study uh, studies that i've been doing right like these you know this one tribe right when they're i forget how old the kid it is when it goes away you know but when he comes back you know the mother you know says oh hi like what's your name <laughs> nice to meet you yeah right. like that, that's incredible that's incredible. Yeah. imagine that what that would do for that boy or that man now and then it reminds me of a lesson that Susie got uh, in ayahuasca from ayahuasca. So it was well, not an actual ceremony in the, in the following days after her, her journey kind of continued for a few days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so a big part of her, why she had such a challenging experience is because she couldn't go, let go. She wouldn't let go. She was like, no, I have a child. I'm not dying. <laughs> I'm not letting go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and until she got I actually beat. remember her talking about that when I was there with you guys. Yeah, yeah. And until she finally got beaten to the ground enough. And then it was like, okay, it's okay. But then <laughs> yeah, a, few yeah, days, I surrender. <laughs> a few nights later, she had a similar experience with Lucan. And again, well, yeah, with him, so you know, her son. And this like, right, not letting him go. And there's like this dream about him. But then like the... The, the message that came through and they said to her is it was you have to let him die mm -hmm. and right being able to just like really like that's you know so incredibly you know powerful and like such a teaching that like is probably you know <laughs> close to unheard of right now yeah i don't know any mothers doing that with their children and just like you know really just like setting them free to be themselves i for, what is it in Ro robert ply what is he, he talks about about like the I forget the word that he uses in Iron John about like the whatever like archetype is and like the key is like under the mother's pillow and that they oh, have to like steal uh, it from well, the archetype is Iron John um and Iron John is or, or the wild man sorry the um, wild or the wild man or the wild boy or something yeah the key to the cage that keeps the wild man is underneath the mother's pillow yeah uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion about the best way for the man to get the key Ultimately, Robert Bly is saying the only way for the man to get the key is to steal the key from under his mother's pillow. She can't give it to him. There can't be a conversation around it. He has to just go and take it. Um, for me, that's really symbolizing like that independence, that that separation of the attachment from the mother of like, now's my time. I got to let the wild man free, ma. Here I go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing I wanted to touch upon was actually, uh, yeah, the mother wound and its role to this, you know, the lack of real men out there. And then, of course, there's the father wound, whatever is happening there. And I remember at a men's group, I had an experience of just wondering why I didn't really, like, I felt weird in like intimate situations with men and like not like super close on like a deeper level like, with pretty much everyone except for you. Um, and, then, you know, so I like, went into that and went through the process and was able to, you know, kind of connect as a little boy, you know, to my father, you know, who was, you know, great, loving provider, but, you know, just wasn't emotionally present. And just, you know, even that, you know, created a big wound to the point where I, you know, didn't feel emotionally comfortable with other men. I thought it was kind of silly. I was even there, like other men's groups before that experience, like, just like this little part of me laughing, like thinking this is silly. Like, oh, look at all these grown men like doing this. Like, this is so this is silly. <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, like I, I knew I wanted to, to be there in that and explore that because I, I knew that voice that was going on wasn't healthy or true or not something I wanted there. And yeah, it came from just like not really having that. And yeah, I can, but like also looking back, you know, there's thinking of like, you know, like brotherhood and men and warriors and like some of the guys in the army and they, they're definitely like a super close connection there but still kind of like you know you feel super safe like right <laughs> um it's, it's so funny i remember one of my as army buddies their wedding 
and then so him and you know that i deployed with both both of them and it was like the wedding night so they're like sleeping separate and like the you know so him and his best man were sleeping and in this house or this yeah whatever it was there's multiple bedrooms multiple beds and they slept in the same bed together the <laughs> night before and just like both in their underwear in the same bed and i thought that was like hilarious but then just like thinking about now like how like beautiful is that and then like yeah. you know but then how like just love much of like a no no in a way is that like now like oh my god like two grown men just in their <laughs> underwear and this not even like separate all right you take under this sheet i'll take under this sheet you know kind of thing buffer, no buffer. <laughs> yeah it's like a good, let me get a couple buffers all right yeah, yeah. i'm like, gonna have that separation all right now now we can do this and it's now okay we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was just yeah so funny but um don't know if I got to a point. Yeah. So if, if we want to be whole in this way, let's, you know, for the individual, if somebody's listening to this man or woman, but you know, there's, yeah, you have to explore the mother wound and the father wound and then start working from there. So do you have any yeah, comments on whatever the heck I just said? Yeah, a lot. Um, I want to, yeah, I'll jump back to the mother wound a little bit and reflect on some of Robert Bly's writing. And one thing you really pointed out uh, and something um, that a, a friend of mine are actually working to bring back is this ritual, this initiation into adulthood uh, where there is no longer the, the transfer of boyhood to manhood or adulthood. Um, and I, you know, I think you and I both agree and a number of other people agree. It's the big reason why a bunch of us adults are just running around like big kids with no idea what to do with ourselves um, because there isn't that initiation into manhood, into adulthood. Um, and I think Iron, and Iron John, he talks about how different tribes between the boy between the ages of eight and 12 or seven and 12, uh, the men would come to the village and take the young boy to go be with the men for X amount of time, sometimes as long as a year. Um, to really to learn and to learn about manhood and to release that attachment to the parents and to welcome them into their manhood, into adulthood, into this brave world that we have that's at our fingertips. And what are you going to do with this, this masculine and feminine energy in yourself? How are you going to, to lead your best life? Um, and he talks about how with the disappearance of that um, young boys are now having to separate themselves from their mothers on their own and how it often takes place is through explosives like explosiveness either through words or physicality um, and one of the examples he gives is uh, the young boy it was a divorced home um, the young boy went and spent a summer with his father um, just his father um, and his other brother so it was like all the men together they did I don't he doesn't go into the details about what he did with his sons but um, when he when the son came back he then went uh, to give his mother a hug while she was doing dishes behind the back and she exploded. And when she exploded, it threw him back. And he talks about that physical explosiveness being the, the signification of your, this is your separation from your mother now. Like you've, you've completed your journey. You're now ready to step off into manhood. Um, but how much more beautiful would it be if there was now ritual and ceremony around that to separate those ties in a more healthy uh, and intentional way, rather than our bodies being the, re the, the response to it and making that physical separation um, that might actually result in an even deeper mother wound or an even deeper father wound. Um, so yes, initiation, ritual, I think that's something that very much needs to be reincorporated into our world. And I'm really interested to see um, yeah, what, how it transforms things for people when we do bring that back um, and what level of, what kind of level up they get from them and where they go from there. Um, yeah, the mother wound is honestly the, the first, I'm really just getting into that for myself personally now. Um, and it, to your point, I think it's so such a heavy focus in men's circles to address the father wound first and, and as fully as you can. Um, but you can only go so deep with that before you have to just start doing it on your own. I mean, you can share with your brothers, but they're not, they can't do the work for you. Um, and so at, in the process of working through my father wound and then arriving at my mother wound, I was able to see the areas I was holding myself back because I was still living from that place of, oh, but I'm mommy's little boy. <laughs> I'm, I'm good, right? I'm safe, right, mom? <laughs> That's my safe place, though. So. Yeah. I don't, I don't challenge that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to. Um, and, and that's what I've really been able to acknowledge in myself was this the level of fear, the level of worry um, that came from the attachment that I had and still have with my own mother. 
Um, and now I'm really working on that attachment and, and learning to let go, especially as I'm getting older and she's getting older. That's, it's an inevitable fact. We're both going to have to let go of each other at some point um, and really working on, you know, I, I think one, one thing that's great about my mother is I can, I can call her up and we can, we can have a face-to-face -face interaction and conversation about things that are, are being kicked up for me throughout therapy or in my men's work. We can address it together and have a conversation about it, which has always been and it, really helpful. And um, I feel like it's helping me to kind of sift through that wound and examine it even better and see the areas in my life I'm showing up with that mother wound more presently. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's what a difficult step, but something I would encourage as well is engage in conversation with your parents around it and like get their feedback and get their input about like, okay, at this point in my childhood, what was going on? I, I've found a lot of context that I've been able to gather from that when I can you know, ask my mom about it and get a snapshot of what was going on in our lives at that point. And why does this wound exist? Um, but if you don't have that relationship with your parents, I think it is just that practice of, um, yeah, really being able to go in and examine that wound deeply on your own um, and encircle with your brothers, maybe a therapist, um, to just understand it as deeply as you can um, and, and make sure that you're not consistently living from that place and holding yourself back because of it. Um, well, uh, there was something else you touched on aside from the mother and father wound. What were, right before we just transitioned out? I don't remember. Um, right. we'll, come back. we'll come back. It's important. And yeah, exactly. yeah so I'm reading this book right now called The Magical Child by Joseph Jilton Pierce. It's like uh, rediscovering your, um, nature's plan for our children. Mm. And it is incredible so far. And just the way he talks about these things and this understanding is just so, I don't know, I just, uh, I love it. And so right we're now we're talking about a lot about like birth. I've talked about birth trauma on the podcast before, um, kind of talk about that a lot, pretty interested in it because I, I think it has a really, really, really big effect that people don't under truly understand. Um, and it's easy to discount. Um, or even if you do kind of like, or just maybe not really understand that, that how deep it can run. Right. Cause I, and then it not even like, he just the way he describes a hot even like a healthy hospital birth is just like you know <laughs> make, makes you really think and wonder and especially when you're uh how he explains yeah just like you know right so you're born so actually damien on the the birth trauma podcast talked about this like you know and, and also but then in the when you're in the womb in this book you know you're in the womb like he talks about matrixes right and so you're in a matrix right? and the, the matrix is the, the womb, right? And then when you come out, the matrix shifts to the mother. And then, you know, when you grow older, the, this is one thing I really like too, around like the age of seven. And I've read this somewhere else in a book, that like the, some like cultures and like tribes used to do this when you around the age of seven, you basically have a ceremony to denounce, not necessarily denouncing, but like acknowledging that your parents are, are your biological parents. But now your new matrix, you know, your, your spiritual mother and father are, you know, the divine feminine and the divine masculine, you know, however you want to look at it, like, you know, those two uh, energies or archetypes, um, you know, the mother earth and, you know, father sky. Uh, and really, uh, like, so you're, you're stepping out more into this, you know, spiritual realm. And then, you know, that's your new matrix. And then further along, you become your own matrix in a way. Mm -hmm. And that I think that was just, and then so, but if you don't have the proper development from matrix to matrix, then there is, you know, a problem in, in the programming, you know, for what you could, what you could call trauma. You know, it, and then, so if you're, especially if you're not in a safe environment and then, you know, I've seen, of course, you know, trauma going back from in the womb, right? So if there's, you know, if, if your mother's hyper stressed out, you know, you are absorbing all those stress chemicals and you're gonna be born with them. And then after you're born and talk about, uh, you know, men or just humans in, in general and how like desensitize, right? Because that, that narrative starts when you're born. You're just this little thing that doesn't feel anything. And uh, so this, procedure you know what it doesn't even matter right this um medicalization of of birth right like turning pregnant women into sick people you know treating treating pregnancy as disease yeah you know create creates some problems and you know so that that goes along and then you know so if you're you know and so you're, you're you're born through this process without like this conscious awareness and not this like a proper you know welcoming and ceremony there's all kind of you know different drugs numbing the you know the proper interplay of the chemicals you're absorbing all these stress chemicals and especially if you're a male now now you're getting cut and just jabbed mm -hmm. right and like that can cause 
you know, serious trauma because you're just like, oh, welcome to earth. And then it's just like, you know, these people just like touching you and not caring and fucking cutting you like yeah. and just stabbing you. And it's just like, what the fuck, you know, is happening? <laughs> put me back, put me back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's why I got you know, a lot of empaths I work with, you know, even I, I work with more females, but a lot of them can just, you know, trace back to these certain feelings of just like sadness, fear, anxiety, you know, and then they bring it right back to their birth, even if it was just like a, a normal seeming birth. Yeah. So I think that is part of the this narrative of you know the wound as well, the wound man, because you know you're you're welcomed in almost as this thing that doesn't feel and it doesn't matter and you know whatever. And then so you just and then you grow up and you're not allowed to express your emotions. You know you're told you're not supposed to cry. You can't do this. You're told you just no and what you can't do constantly. And then you just are born and then you just internalize all of it. You're filled with rage and you just you know, never went through any ceremony and rituals. So now you're just seeing how many women you can sleep with, how many beers you can chug in a night and <laughs> doing drugs and just like climbing buildings and uh, yeah. I'm not talking about myself here, but um, <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, joining the army. Yeah. And yeah, that was, so that's, I think that's part of the narrative uh, to the wound as well. And then that's yeah, why I guess well, the, the remedy in a way is like reparenting yourself. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And to your point of, of, this birth process being quite chaotic nowadays from the vaccinations that were received pretty, pretty soon after birth, not only, but not to mention um, uh, circumcision. Um, what came up for me as you were uh, talking about all the, just the emotional ways in which we're desensitized when during circumcision, or I'm sorry, due to circumcision, that foreskin is removing 20% of sensation that we would be able to feel. Um, from sexual intercourse, but mm. because we're from the get go, we're, we're desensitizing ourselves, not only from an emotional way, but from a physical, physical standpoint as well. And in a, a very important physical way, when it comes to sexual intimacy with your partner, that's 20% of your sensation being removed from circumcision. Um, yeah, I got yeah, lots of chills. I, yeah, I got, I mean, the, the proofs in the pudding, the ways in which we are desensitizing ourselves as men which in effect in this human complex that we're in is setting ourselves up for failure. When you're telling us we can't feel emotionally, but not only emotionally, we can't feel to our highest capacity when it comes to sex as well. Yeah. Uh, but now you're just you're a toxic narcissist masculine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So there, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done for, for us as men, um, but more so I feel like it really stems from an education standpoint and educating ourselves and other men about about the ways in which we've been um we've been lied to in a sense about you know you don't have problems you don't not in a sense the ways we we have been lied to um from desensitizing ourselves from an emotional standpoint to even a physical standpoint i mean i christ i remember um even when it came to physical pain um a big message that i received from my own father was mm -mm, like don't cry even no matter how bad it hurts you got this kid don't don't shed those tears um, and I held on to that for so long, right? Like yeah. this day, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'll fucking lose a finger with an ax. I'm like, oh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we get, we get like this false sense of bravado that comes from that. Right. But how damaging is that? If you can't even tap into your own body's physical sense of pain, you're not responding to its natural tendency to keep you safe. <laughs> it's like, there's a reason that that pain, that physical pain hurts. And it's because I shouldn't be indulging in this any more than I need to. Like, let me, let me learn from my body and, Ooh, maybe I should do a little less of that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, it reminds me of that beautiful Temescal ceremony when I had the, uh, right. This is the reconnection to this earth matrix. Right. Uh, I still, I think that's still like almost where I am in my development. Like, yeah, I feel like, yeah, I'm just, all right, fine, make it out of there now into this earth. And, you know, still evolving into my own, or I'm sure, you know, a blend of all of it, but I was like, you know, how do I feel safe on this earth? And then, you know, we you and I were talking about this the other day, and now I, that's kind of resurfaced again, where um, like this lack of like, you know, safety and security, always waiting for something bad to happen. Um, and yeah, so continuing to, to work on that, right? And that, that message that I got in that, in that sweat lodge, right? That's just, you know, what kind of world do you want to be born back into? You know, you said you were born into one of, you know, fear, scarcity, danger, and so I was like, uh, not those, that's for sure. That. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just, you know, being, of course, you know, both highly sensitive, right? Or highly sensitive to my mother. My mother is very, you know, a lot of anxiety. And, you know, we just had a little altercation the other day. She kind of blew up at me because I was, you know, feeling that, you know, her, she walked into the room and I already feel anxious. She starts nitpicking all these different, like, little things and micromanaging. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, 
just feels like super like, anxious around her and made a little comment and then she like blew up at me and left. I was like, well, that was strange. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's probably some, you know, deeper mother wound in there for me to, to explore about that, you know, sensitivity and that like state of anxiety about every around everything. Yeah. I can, I can totally resonate that um, for my own anxiety. And, and I know a lot of my anxiety comes from my own mother wound. Um, I think one thing my mother always used to say, I'm, I'm the mother, it's my job to worry about you. And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't worry about me. Like yeah. you're not helping yourself and you're not helping me in that process. Like help me to help you and help myself by just trusting that everything's going to go exactly the way it's supposed to go. And regardless of the outcome, it's, it's supposed to be. Yeah, treating them like little warriors, little uh, little princes. You know, I trust you, right? And I, oh, it's my job to worry about you. Um, and yeah, you know, my also I think of you know my mother, right? She lost her sister twin or as a baby, and you know, so for you know her mother, my grandmother, her story, you know, there what the narrative that she created there was like, you know, she always told my mom like she lost one child, lost one little girl. Don't ever leave me. You don't ever die, right? So super attachment to there to the point where, you know, that my mom developed a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear around death and fear of certain things, you know, um, because she was told, you know, oh, you're, you're my little girl. Don't leave me. Right. Or you lost one. I can't lose you, too. Yeah. Uh, and so you, then you just walk around in this world afraid. Yeah. For sure. yeah. yeah. And then that gets passed down in, in certain ways. But um, it's not this isn't directly related to masculinity, but I feel like it it uh. They go hand in hand, but just how how out of touch we with death we are in today's mm. day and age. Like if you we used to be so in touch with death, like but now how separate is it from us? The people who die are in the hospital. When they die, they clear the hospital room before anybody can get there to get them all safe and tucked and put away to get ready for the funeral. But if you go back to like when the Vikings were slaying each other down the field, they were like welcoming death with open arms of like send me to Valhalla, and we're losing touch with that, and we're seeing. I feel like we're just so disconnected in today's day and age um, from what life is actually about. And it's like, there's always this risk of, of loss and of losing your life. Um, but I feel as we, as men, as we begin to honor ourselves more and lean into uh, the opposing forces and the tension, but it's hard for us to lean into those opposing forces and tensions right now because of the damage that happens to us throughout childhood, throughout birth, throughout our life in general, we're programmed to kind of lose our warrior at a young age. And Robert Bly talks about this in depth. If your war, if your house is continually being invaded from a young age, you're slowly going to lose that warrior and be afraid to pick up your own sword. And I feel like that's where we're, that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, we're coming out of that now. I'm in, in Colorado. I'm seeing a lot of men kind of be like, "There's got to be another way." I, I want to start diving deeper into my shit and really learn what's going on, and I want to pick the sword back up. I feel like once more men start to pick the sword back up, we're going to lead into those opposites, into the opposing force from the universe and those tensions um, and really start to, to take off. And who knows where the world will go from there. Um, but there has to be, you know, we have to we have to channel our warrior. We have to become uh, comfortable to pick the sword back up and to face death in pursuit of what it is that we really want. Yeah, we got to turn the war the warrior into a warrior. Exactly. Um, and that's what's been coming up for me actually a lot and right that i remember after that thing with the the Tate healing retreat with joyce right i kind of i really shut down the warrior hard yeah. and i was just like you know didn't even like other people talking about it i was like what the hell you know about warrior you never been a war like shut up and just like really i was like you know that threw that away big time and just like oh yeah because on one level i did have this like feeling like going going back you know afterwards of like not having to fight anymore mm -hmm. But that didn't mean like completely denouncing like this whole part of yourself, right? And so I've been working on still kind of honoring that and, uh, you know, going taking time to go through the archetypes because, um, you know, after that event, a lot of you know, it's just things and just, you know, my the nature of just right wanting to get to that end point as soon as possible. Like, you know, I just it's like I wanted to shoot straight to the, the full embodied king, but I didn't want to go through all the other archetypes to get there. Um, and so now I'm like, you know, being more patient. I was like, actually, you know, now looking at this more of like the decade of the warrior um, instead of like, you know, I, I thought that was my 20s. But then I'm looking back now, I was like, I wasn't the warrior, you, you know, because I, you know, I went to war, um, you know, I went to college. I 
you know, started businesses, I traveled, you know, I did stupid shit and, <laughs> you know, just had an incredible time and, you know, met, you know, met my life partner and like all this stuff. But <laughs> looking back, I was like, that's not, that wasn't the worry. That was the cowboy. Yeah. Right? That was the cowboy archetype or, you know, which was, you know, and then comes the warrior. So it feels like, you know, now I'm more stepping into like this embodied warrior. And of course, you touch on all of them at the same time. So definitely like the king is there hand in hand, like right, this warrior king, especially as a father now. Um, and also that really comes out a lot in having a business with employees. I really feel the king archetype. So definitely you know, this warrior king for sure. But then I think, uh, you know, maybe, you know, 40s plus I like, will be, you know, more you know, right now it's maybe it's like 75 warrior 25 king and then my when it's like it's a 40 it'll probably be you know the other way around and where was i going with all this i was talking about oh archetypes but no another thing i wanted to talk about was oh like riff on so we talked about like these stories and these wounds but now let's talk about if you have time i don't even know when do you have to go <laughs> no i'm good okay and then you know maybe talking about what this whole masculine looks like you know for for you is it's going to be different for everyone but for us and you brought up vikings and i really like that because i've been listening to uh, learning more about it i remember there was this guy who was on paul check's podcast and then also now just on aubrey marcus's and i've been i gotta listen to that one yeah he was on paul check's first i think that's how aubrey got a hold of him and i listened to that and yeah he paints a very different picture of a viking mm. and you know based on actual facts and history and you know they're they're not just like these crazy, you know, psycho, yeah. smelly brutes. Uh, <laughs> of course, you know, they, they have that, a strong warrior, you know, fighter within them. But, you know, for the most part, they, they're very well-rounded, right? They, uh, they talked about how, you know, they usually, they take, they, you know, they bathe regularly. They take, you know, good care of themselves. And, you know, and even like the hair, right? I, th I sent you that thing about long hair earlier, yeah, um, which, which <laughs> is also something that, intuitively i've been feeling for a long time and, yeah, I, and I did even i talked okay. to it about he saw he talks about something about long hair about the the measure of, or just uh hair in general and how in today's world we've actually we don't embrace hairiness as much as we used to and we prefer like more of the clean cut clean shaven look but he correlates hair with a direct relation to sensitivity and where you're cutting that off you're cutting off a lot of your sensitivity because you, I mean, it's just too much to feel. So he, he really uh, preaches about just how, you know, if you can just let that hair go, you're really in tune with your own sensitive nature. Yeah, that's what, you know, we hear a lot about Native Americans saying. And then, but yeah, if you look at these different traditions and different like warrior traditions too, right? Uh, the samurai and just even like monks, or right? even though they might shave some of their head, right? They still have this one piece that's, you know, super long. Um, and, you know, and this long hair was like highly revered and, you know, even just look back and, yeah, and even kings and like warriors and like yeah, long. So anyway, Vikings. Yeah, they were into beauty, right? They they liked nice things. They liked to be clean. They liked to take good care of themselves, um, and they weren't in, inherently like super violent people. Like they, they did some raids, you know, but a lot of history got turned in terms of like what actually happened. And it, like for the most part, you know, they'd rather just like you know like fish and farm and that kind of stuff. And of course, you know, there there would be some raids and there'd be some war, mm -hmm. but they they weren't yeah just that so i've been like thinking about for this for myself and just like kind of like really liking that uh viking archetype and then like the women right the women were equals mm -hmm. you know, you know if, if anything if not like you know like you know more yeah, right just like you, you talked about in like norse mythology um i forget like a uh, name of odin's wife there it wasn't freak was it something else but um yeah, you know, she was like, no, Freya was one of the daughters, but you know, she was like the, the only one who could best Odin, right? So they talked about her as like, you know, the, the woman who knows everything, but speaks nothing of it. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, just got lit up with chills. Yeah. Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did when I heard it too. I got him again. Um, yeah, so so they, you know, they honored their women, um, took care of their, their women, and they, they took care of themselves, and they're like clean, and you know, they could be warriors, they could be farmers, they could be fishers, traders, all these different things. So yeah, as we're just talking about what this like, you know, and into arts, you know, different arts and crafts, creativity. And um, so that's what I really, you know, I'm looking to like explore for myself today. You know, how can I, you know, I want to honor my women. I want to have, uh, you know, also be, you know, that provider with, you know, like my business and you know, play with my kids, but also, you know, and that's the one thing I've been having a hard time too, is finding like, 
you know, what does the, the king look like, the father in my house, like trying to find a balance between playing with them, but also leading them and not letting them just run all over me nonstop and constantly pulling on me. Will you play with me? Will you play with me? So finding a balance there and, you know, having a creative outlet and like, taking care of your body and, you know, your health and, you know, being, you know, having different like expressions, whether, you know, poetry or some form of art and not being afraid to cry and like, you know, doing men's groups and therapy. And that's kind of like what this is looking like for me right now. So what do you, yeah, what's it kind of look like to you to be like this healthy, wholehearted masculine? And what is your picture of like that archetype? Mm, beautifully said. Um, yeah. <sighs> Let me, yeah, just taking a minute to soak it all in so I can really give it to you here. Um, the, the key, the key thing you really touched on there for me in this pursuit is balance. Um, I've come to the conclusion that human beings are just complex house plants, right? We need a good dose of time in nature, sunlight, water, good nutrition. Um, and then the, 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 I guess not the complex, but the, the side that the part that goes with that as being human is that honoring and the validation of the self of the emotion of, you know, just honoring where you're at and meeting yourself where you're at, instead of trying to like have this, I feel like we so often do have this tight group of trying to control everything as man. And when things start to slip out of this grip is when we start to kind of come undone and resort to those more anger and lashing out and slanderous ways. So for me, it really, and this, when working with clients this is what I really focus on too, is balance. You know, where, where could I be bringing more balance into my life? Where, and, and knowing myself, where do I get, become most alive and will easily like pour too much out of that cup and lose some balance. Um, for me, that's in like, that's in podcasting, that's in like anything around the business that I'm developing. I, I love it so much that I can just get so absorbed that I've just dumped everything I've had for by like 11 o'clock. So I started at seven, I'll go right to 11. And I just pour from all of that creativity and all of that cup. And now my skills are like this. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't do a good job to like check in with myself throughout this process to make sure I was conserving some energy to do other things that make Max exactly who he is and make me allowed to be the most wholehearted human being that I can be. Um, and show, when, I, when I can show up in balance, what it looks like is presence, groundedness. Um, I, can walk, I can step into it and I, and I know re I'm really keen on my own self intuitively when I'm, when I'm spread too thin. When I'm spread too thin, thin, I walk into a men's circle and immediately I'm, I'm keyed up. I'm like, oh, because I have such a propensity to, to want to step into a leadership role and facilitate. Um, so if I have been pouring from that cup all day and I walk into a men's circle, um, even if I don't have to show up as a leader, I get triggered because there's that part of me that's like, oh, I poured from that cup all day. I don't have what it takes to show up as a leader. What if I need to be a leader? And the stories start and the spiraling starts and the rumination starts. But if I've been tending my garden um, and really taking care of myself, I can show up into that space and really just work with what's alive in the room and be present to it and not reject anything or judge anything. But I just feel the best way I can explain it is I feel like a sponge. <laughs> I walk in and I, I don't absorb and hold on to energies, but they, I absorb them. And then it's like, I can release them at the same time. So the absorption and the release is happening at the same time, where if I'm out of balance, I'm just taking it all in and I'm not being keen on myself to be like, all right, let this energy pass through you and don't just hold on to it. That's like the conduction I was mentioning earlier of, of being copper. Um, so yeah, when I'm, when I'm in balance and, and I show up in these different circles and I show up on podcasts or I show up one-on-one -on -one with a client, um, I just feel so clear. I guess I can kind of see my own energy as like the silhouette of water um, and things just pass through me. Um, but I am also grounded. I'm not up in the air in the cosmos, I'm grounded, I'm listening from a place of curiosity. Um, and I'm really checking in with myself as I'm taking in the information from a client, let's say, um, and able to reflect back and work with them in this like beautiful flow. Um, it's hard to give real like solid, uh, concrete terms to this. But yeah, the biggest thing that comes for me is this flow. Um, and this, this playfulness too. like, I'm not I think prior to when I wasn't in balance, when I was still like working to get myself to that place of balance, that's still like an everyday process. We're always checking in with ourselves to see what we need more of in our cups. 
But prior to, I was just showing up in all these different spaces, not really aware of what I was absorbing or how I was absorbing it and how it was impacting me. And now I'm able to operate in those spaces and trust that I can exist in those spaces exactly as I am, as, as I'm supposed to be. Um, and I'm not judging myself for the different emotional triggers that come up. I am sitting with it. It comes to me and I, I identify it and I, and I sit with it and I can oh, breathe into it and be like, yeah, this is, this is, I know exactly where this is coming from, right? This is, this is the father wound. This is work that I've been doing for a long time and I'm aware of it. Um, and I can be able to better know is now the time to work with this or do I need to come back to this at another time? And it depends on the situation I'm in. Um, but yeah, showing up as a, as a wholehearted masculine male is, um, it can be sometimes daunting in today's world. Um, we're not, we're, especially if you're in a space where other men don't embody that themselves, where they, where they're not comfortable with their emotions and you're sharing or you're showing up your authentic self and just keeping it real. It's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm kind of doing shitty right now. Um, I've been in those situations where I can share that with other men. And if they're not um, in tune with their own emotional selves, it's really triggering and hard because they're, they're kind of rejecting the part of themselves that is doing shitty too. Um, but when I'm, when I'm in a, a circle of men who are in that energy and embodying that wholehearted masculine, there's no, uh, there's no absorption and holding on to. It's all just an exchange. And it's all just, we're, we're in this co-creative space together as men, uh, working with the emergent masculine energy that's in the room um, and just playing with it and seeing, seeing what comes from it. Um, but I guess to really like hone this in and give a real concrete expression to embodying this wholehearted masculine, when I'm in that space, I wake up in the morning and um, I just feel connected to everything and everyone around me. Um, and the negative self-talk isn't in my ear. And if it does pop into my ear, I'm able to greet it with a different voice than I used to. Instead of f doing battle and fighting with it, I'm able to, be, to welcome it and welcome it in and be like, hmm, you again, welcome back. What do you, what do you need? How can I show you compassion and love? Um, so there's been a large emphasis for me in, in developing this wholehearted masculine and changing the narrative that I engage in with my shadow um, and greeting it with love and compassion rather than with that ego of like, oh, I just got to, I got to heal through that next thing so I can beat my shadow and just be done with it and not have to deal with it anymore. That was a really hard lesson learned. Several slaps in the face to be like, mm, the shadow doesn't work like that. It's attached to you. <laughs> um, and also just the, how I show up in relationship with my partner feels so much more flowy and like I have space for her and for me. And I'm not in that ego headspace of like, mm, I don't have time for this right now. Let me, let me be in my own ooh, uh, shit, so to speak. Um, I just show up as with that warrior king energy with the lover uh, and the magician. It really feels like they're all there with me, um, able to play, able to get serious when we need to get serious, able to take right action as a warrior and not just take action for the sake of action. Um, but really standing true and firm in my own heart, in my own heart space and leading from that heart space uh, is where I really come most alive when I'm em embodying the wholehearted masculine in myself. And it's a, uh, I don't, I don't want to paint the picture like I'm doing this every day. This is a, this is, this is a, a, a practice. This is something that takes repeated effort. It's something, you know, I have my days where I feel like I'm crushing that wholehearted masculine energy every day. And I have days where I feel like I'm at the very first step of my journey again. Um, and I think for, well, I don't think I know for me, it's been this, uh, that just, again, that meeting myself where I'm at. And it's like, okay, if you're at that next layer in the journey where you feel like you're starting from square one again, that's okay. What steps do we need to take to make me feel more secure in this space so I can get back to that wholehearted masculine piece while I'm on my journey? Beautiful. Beautiful. I, uh, there's a bunch of stuff that keeps popping up that I want to chat about, but I'm actually feeling closing time feeling okay. kind of an end to it so maybe we'll just have to to do it again because yeah there's things just keep popping up feeling the excitement and one of those i think i'm just I'm gonna start interviewing just my friends and like past clients for my podcast it's more fun 
than like reaching out. And then, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's, it's fun with like you know, connecting with new people and everything. But I don't know, something about this I Help really enjoyed. Make- so, um, with that note, any final just resources, tips, suggestions, people who want to, uh, or maybe if you, if you got a minute, touch on if any men are listening who are kind of new, like they like, oh, something about this really makes sense, but they don't feel like they're able to, you know, they don't have anyone in their world right now to kind of, you know, share that with, you know, anything to someone in that situation. And then just lastly, uh, any resources, tips, whatever you got. Yeah. Um, I'll speak personally to the one of, of men um, resonating with this, but not really sure of the right next step to take, or where do you even find something like this? Um, and I think there's a, also a, that what comes with that is this layer of uh, since it's been just beaten into us for so long of like that hippy dippy woo woo shit. Like, I don't need that. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And I think that's as men, the kind of the trickster that we can play on ourselves. I can't tell you how many t- times that's popped in my head of like, I'm good. I don't need that. I got my shit figured out. And it's like, mm. <laughs> let's take a few steps back. I actually could use that extra depth of reflection with brothers. Uh, and I'm learning that uh, as introspective as I've been, there's a whole other layer of self-learning that comes through connection with other men on a wholehearted, uh, fully accepted uh, platform. So I feel, you know, if you're, if you're at that place where this is really resonating with you, but there's still that layer of, uh, I don't know, it's that, that emotional being within a group of men that's emotional still feels really hard. I feel you'll find in most men's circles, um, as a new man enters the circle, there's still that level of adjustment and getting used to it. And I think give yourself permission. You don't have to jump into the deep end right away. You can take small steps, maybe try once a month going to either an online men's community, or if you know of one physical that's meeting in person and that's more your jam, uh, see if you can get in there. Um, And just, you can't do this. Um, Everyone's different, but for me personally, I I had to take small steps to to get really fully immersed in this. You gotta keep tabs of your own um, self as you're on this journey. And um, don't just throw yourself into the deep end right away and expect to get all of these results and everything really quick. You, a lot of men will see results really quickly, but I notice what follows up with that is then um, the emotional side of it, of, of the catch up of honoring the parts of yourself that you've invalidated for so long and that's a different that's a difficult process to really meet yourself where you're at when you've been programmed for so long to ignore that part of yourself and be like, mm, that's not true. I'm not actually like that. When really there could be parts of yourself that are like that. So start small. I say try once a month with a men's group. Um, in terms of resources that I have for that, um, uh, once a month, we have a, uh, through Wholehearted Masculine, um, a stories of men event. And each month, there's a different topic. Uh, so February's topic is forgiveness. We'll have a group of men show up. We all meet in one common Zoom room. Then we break out into smaller Zoom uh, breakout rooms. Uh, and from there, each man shares a story related to the month's topic. And what I've seen for men in that circle, and I've seen particularly the, the um, several men uh, that of the demographic you're describing, Mike, who are like new to this, but really resonating with it, who have showed up in that space and been really inc- uncomfortable and the amount of vulnerable shares there are. But then you see after month two, month three, this kind of shift of, oh, these men are being really vulnerable, open and real with each other. And they're not judging each other. It's not that ball busting East Coast mindset of, come on, you fucking pussy, get it together. (laughs) It's more of that remembering of how as men, we used to gather and circle together and share our stories together and connect with each other and be real with each other about where we're at. This isn't something that's new. This is a remembering for us men. And we're all being called to it in one way or another right now. Um, And take, take your time with your journey. You'll get there exactly when you're supposed to. I still firmly believe in that. Um, but yeah, just to plug that again, if you go to wholeheartedmasculine.com, there's a stories of men event. You can take a look on there and just see uh, some of the different topics that we have in the coming months. Uh, and it's an opportunity to kind of flex that vulnerability muscle and get some reps in and, and get a feel for what that looks like and feels like with your brothers. Um, in terms of uh, 
different material you can digest. One of my go-to books that I'm, since I've read it, have just nonstop been recommending is um, uh, The Hidden Spirituality of Men by Matthew Fox. That really, um, I read that three years into my men's work journey. And even, even that far into my journey, there was a lot of epiphanies, a lot of realizations of the different ways in which we've been stifled as men, uh, the different ways I've stifled myself, um, and the ways in which we can come out of that stifledness um, through, he, he goes over 10 different archetypes and really shows you how you resonate with different archetypes. So uh, for me, that was just, that was huge when I was able to identify the archetype of man and masculinity that I really resonate with uh, and could really hone in on that. And it really helps me to bring more of that balance into my own life. Um, I think another... Another one that's not directly about uh, men in general, but just something that really helped kind of reframe things for me and get my mind into the right space and, and as I was traveling down this journey of men's work was No Mud, No Lotus by Thich Nhat Hanh, um, which that's just the whole premise of like, if you don't have the mud, the lotus doesn't grow. Um, and it really gave me permission uh, to acknowledge my shit and the mud that I was working through and, and be okay with it instead of shaming myself for having that dirt. Um, and then lastly, because I'm reading it right now and I flashed it in front of the screen so many times, Iron John by Robert Bly. This is more of um, a dive into the, meta the metaphor for masculinity and how uh, in today's society, we've really gotten away uh, from some of these old metaphors and how we can start to embody those again. I'll be the first to admit the first time I picked this book up, I had to put it back down because it was actually really triggering for me and the current process I was in. Uh, so proceed with caution, I would say. Um, and other than that, I find um, one thing that I also really had in terms of resources was I at least always had one friend in my circle who I felt like I could be real with about my experience and with my emotional experience. And if you're a man who has that one friend and that's, that's how you're flexing this vulnerability muscle and getting comfortable in that space, keep practicing there. Um, I feel like that's a great place to practice. And that's actually where I got a lot of my practice, like working with you, Mike, and uh, another one of my really close friends, Tom. Um, we've always just been able to keep it super real about where we're at in our own process and our, in our own healing. Um, and when you can be met with that acknowledgement uh, of where you are at and, and feel seen, heard, and safe in that place, um, the level of freedom that I've received from that, uh, that, that has been given to me by others, but in that process has allowed me to give that to myself, uh, has just been immense. Um, so the resources are out there. If it's not your cup of tea, like I said, to dive into the in-person stuff or online communities, start with the books, start with a close friend, um, and see where it takes you. Um, and obviously, uh, yeah, I've got my website out. If this stuff is resonating with you, let's talk more about it too. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to walk along this journey with you and see what we can learn from each other. Great stuff. Great stuff. Thank you for sharing. And um, I want to do another podcast where we just talk about all the mystical experiences we've had together. Let's do it. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot. <laughs> the, the cosmic giggle, or the, yeah, or the, co the cosmic, the cosmic laughing gas. 45 minutes straight. <laughs> that was so weird. Oh, it was great. Much needed. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was hilarious. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll keep, if anyone's still listening, we'll keep them on edge till next time. Yeah, so they learn about maybe what talk the cosmic about laughing gas was. Uh, Vikings too. <laughs> That'd be fun. Yeah, I definitely want to do some like channeling practice and like connecting with like the energy and what I can bring through. Yeah. Next, yeah. the next Zoom video you'll see of Mike and I is just going to be the two of us with battle shields and axes fighting <laughs> Vikings. <laughs> Very loving way. <laughs> yes, of course. Right. Very respectful, <laughs> loving way. All right. That's a wrap. See you all next time.